Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the beginning of SimFest 2021. Uh, we definitely appreciate you joining us tonight to check out the Proxy Creator Tools. For those people in our workshop, uh, you might want to stay muted, but if you have questions, please go ahead and ask them. Uh, our presenters in the past have been very happy to take questions along the way. I'll assume that's still the way of tonight. Those of you watching on YouTube or Twitch, please go ahead and ask your questions there, and we will try and get them passed on to our presenters. We have a great SimFest coming up this weekend. So if you can tune in tomorrow, we start 11.30 tomorrow and run through 7 p.m. Great presentations on a lot of topics, and I will share those in chat. We'll have another presentation June 16th, where we'll be showing off uh, an indie-made VR game out of Georgia. I'll post information on that in chat as well. And with that, let me go ahead and hand it over to Tim, Timothy Johnson and Alex Dudley. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, uh, it's really cool to be uh, kicking off SimFest with you guys. And uh, it's always great to chat with you guys and, and show off some cool stuff and just hang out. And uh, the, uh, the off-screen just banter is, I mean, more than worth the trip. Uh, okay, so what are we doing here? Uh, my name is Timothy Johnson. I am the COO of Gallium Studios. And uh, myself and Alex, who we'll introduce here in a second, uh, are going to be showing you through um, our proxy creator tools uh, uh, suite uh, and all the cool things that you can do with it. Um, proxy is uh, a new game that is launching, <laughs> should be any moment now, uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, the very first phase of Proxy will be launching. This is a game uh, created by Will Wright that we've been working on for the past a year and a half. Uh, so this demo, uh, if you guys were around in November for the Siege initial kickoff of our, of our like super early alpha version of this, this is the Enhance. We've had a bunch of people play with it and we've improved it, uh, the tool set. So the next slide, this is who we are. So there's those two handsome devils. Uh, I am Timothy Johnson, as I said, I've been working with Will uh, and Lauren Elliott. Uh, Will Wright, if you're unfamiliar, he's a guy who made The Sims and SimCity and Spore, uh, amongst uh, many other things. Lauren Elliott is our creative director uh, and CEO of the company. He uh, was one of Bruderbund's uh, early employees. He created Where in the World is Carmen San Diego and many, many other uh, hits. Uh, so I am the COO and uh, uh, up until recently, I was a principal engineer, but someone else has taken that over from me for now. And, and I'm and I'm Alex. I'm uh, one of the artists on the team. Much shorter intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alex. That was a great job. Okay, <laughs> so um, how can you get started uh, creating things? So we've got two links for you guys uh, that potentially uh, someone can copy and paste into the chat. So uh, the, the tools at the moment are still, um, we're, we're um, allowing people in at a small clip. The first thing that we are asking people to do is go through our official uh, Discord community. Um, we just kicked off a new Discord setup, so come join through there and then uh, agree to our terms of service and all those things. We can get you into the creator tools. If you don't feel like going through Discord, there's the Gallium Studios content creators link at the top where you can put in your email address and we can, um, as we're dishing out more and more of these keys and uh, these invitations into the system, uh, you can be the first people to start playing with it. Uh, we've had people in since Siege and we've been slowly letting more people in and we're about to do a big, as I said, a few weeks away, um, kickoff of this first iteration. So um, let's talk about what you can create. Let's talk about where you're creating it um, and what this is all about. So Proxy is a game uh, that is uh, very much about memories. And it's you, the tagline is that you're creating an artificial intelligence that's based on your memories or the memories of others. So think of um, the best comparison is The Sims, but instead of giving it some characteristic traits and some sliders, um, it is, you are going right into the brain of it and you are creating memories. And these memories are made up of a whole bunch of things. And one of the things that we're uh, really excited about is these visualizations of those memories and all the objects that go inside it. 
So we as a studio are of course making a bunch of them, but we also opened up our tool set so that um, outside artists, outside creatives uh, can create things as well. And we're gonna go show this all, all off to you. Um, so what can you create? We classify uh, this stuff as renderable objects uh, that kind of falls into three big categories. Um, 2D artwork, which we'll be using for uh, backgrounds and 360 backgrounds. 3D artwork, which can be used as uh, these objects and decorations. Uh, it can be even larger, they can be like ground planes. And audio, which could be sound effects, stings, full compositions. Uh, these are the kinds of things that you could uh, create and then put into the game. With these things, you augment your memories with them. So if you've got a memory about, I don't know, uh, skipping school one day, uh, you might have an audio clip uh, of, of the, what kind of music was playing when you did it. You might have, skipping school is not a great example, going to school on time. Uh, you might have an audio clip of the music that was playing. You might have an, uh, some sort of image that reminds you of the setting, some sort of 3D graphics that you can arrange and place inside it. And these are created not only by us, but also by the community. Uh, so as a creator, you can do this and then get these things into the game for others to use and enjoy. Um, okay, where are we going next with this? I think we're gonna, was I gonna show off the uh, actual application here? Sure. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. He said sharing his screen. Can we do it at the same time or do I need to? Oh, there we go. Okay, are you guys seeing this? Yeah. Okay. So this is my iOS version of the game. Um, Proxy is going to be available on Mac OS, Windows, iOS, and Android. I'm just showing my iPad at the moment. So um, let me just click here into my wallet, which is my inventory. Um, and this is just the viewer. This is the uh, way that you can look at all the things that you currently possess. I'm going to click on my inventory. I've got all sorts of things. So these are what we call the decorators, kind of like standalone. Uh, deals. Um, I play the piano, so I'm going to pick a piano. And so here we've got a 3D piano that was created by someone else. I ended up acquiring it uh, through our, um, you can buy, sell, and trade all this stuff. Um, and so, yeah, 3D piano. Um, other things that we have are the ground planes. Uh, here's a new one I just picked up called Tiles. And so these are all things that can go inside and augment your memory. Um, effects, I have a smoke effect. So uh, one of the new things for those that have been with us for a little while, um, we've been introducing more and more uh, types of items that our content creators can make. Uh, effects is coming soon for everybody, but we're playing with them internally ourselves right now. So we've got a couple of pretty deep things. And then audio, I apparently don't have any audio at the moment, but, um, and this is just like a little viewer, just a kind of like a pedestal so you can see all the different things. Uh, when it comes to backgrounds, I just got the classroom background. It's not as exciting as I thought. Let me see another one. Let's do neighborhood. All right, in the wall of viewer, I can't really zoom in. I'm gonna zoom in here in a memory in a second. But these, uh, this is like the show off pedestal part of it to where you can uh, uh, play around and see stuff. Um, I'm going to go into my memory archive. These are all memories uh, that I've been creating for the past few weeks. Um, this one here, playing with the Memvis, this is a good one. So playing with the Memvis, um, just through the way that um, sharing on QuickTime works with my iPad. There's actually a soundtrack playing right now, which no one can hear, but it's like some nice contemporary piano music playing. Um, if I go into the memory visualization, this is the core of Proxy's memories. So um, a memory is composed of multiple parts. This is the render. This is the, this is the visualization I was talking about. So uh, when I have in here, I've got, um, this nice uh, Antarctic kind of watery uh, ground. I have a canoe that I have put in. These are all individual things that I have picked up from different creators. Uh, and you can play with them, you can move them around, you can resize them. 
Uh, I also have a jet ski uh, for some reason, so a campfire. And these are all the different things you can add to it. So let me add, um, let me do one of those backgrounds again. This doesn't make a lot of sense, but let's put an American city behind it. So here we go. So now we've got ourselves a memory where I was uh, canoeing in an American city um, on an ice floe. It's your memory, I, I, I do what you want. Um, other things that we have inside that are new to the memory maker uh, are the lighting system. So we can add uh, different types of lights and move them around. These are point lights. Um, well, that's a cloud, let me get off the cloud. Grab the light, there we go. So as we move the lights around, I'm not sure if you guys can see how well you can see the lighting change. But we now have the ability to add the different lights. Uh, we have three types of lights, a point light, spotlight, and a directional light. Uh, if you're familiar with Unity, these are kind of the light primitives. And then we have different ways that we can play around with them of uh, changing their color and their strength and their intensity and their luminosity, uh, things like that. But what we're talking about specifically here is the stuff. So let me grab another thing. Let's search for something. Alex, what should I put into the scene? Uh, walrus. Something that fits the Arctic, right? <laughs> there we go. Hey, look, I have a walrus. So I'm going to take a walrus. There's my walrus. And I will put it in. Uh, and place it, and I'll scale it down. There we go. There we go. There's our walrus kind of chilling out, waiting for things. So what's interesting about this is that out of all these objects, these uh, the clouds, the ground, the fire, the, the cave here, this is an object someone made as well. Each one of these were made by different artists and published to our system um, in different means. So some of these were made, uh, I think the, the, the ocean Arctic thing was made by Alex, the clouds were made by some of our partners overseas. Um, and they're all using our system to uh, make them available to where anyone can uh, acquire them. And that's the memory uh, that we call this the MemViz, the memory visualization. That's the memory visualization in a nutshell. And uh, audio, as I said, you can't hear it, but you can record your own audio. You can uh, create your own audio, audio artifacts. So if you want sound effects or stings or even full compositions, uh, it's all available to you. Uh, all right, so I think from there we can have you share the screen again. And we'll talk about, okay, that's great. How do we actually do this? How do we get this into the system? Sure. All right. Uh, Stop sharing. And I will take it. All right. Okay. We're back to the slideshow, right? Yep. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, I'm going to do a quick demo of how the creator's tools work with a 3D model. Like if you want to make a prop of your own and get it into the game, this is the way you will do it. And the other types of uh, assets will follow a similar approach, but they may need to be set up in Unity a little bit differently. But um, we'll focus on 3D for this. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just give you the high level first, and then I'll open up Unity. Um, so here. Uh, we have a tool that is a plugin for Unity. So as long as you have Unity and the correct version and everything set up, you can install it. Um, we have a shader that is built in the game so that all of the objects that are made can share the same texture, which is this color uh, gradient thing. And each of those color gradients are customizable. So once you, you just map the parts of your model in the UV editor of your modeling program of choice and uh, just apply the colors wherever you want. And then those are uh, customizable in Unity with uh, sliders. Yes. Yes, uh, right. And then there's a little preview button where you can see it uh, in the world. So here's this gem item that uh, we have. And then that's what it would potentially look like um, with other things around it. Um, so the basic idea is you build your 3D model. Uh, you UV it to that. A uh, little color texture I just showed you. Bring it into Unity, and it's pretty straightforward. You just uh, add a couple of scripts as components that will be pre-built into the tool. 
and uh, there you can choose your color sets. So if you want that gem to have multiple color options, you can choose one color set and then add another one and uh, they'll be swappable in the game. And then you add a collider and uh, it's uh, pretty simple. Um, oh, go back. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, then, then you uh, fill out the form on the tool. You have to make an icon uh, for the actual asset, <clears throat> name it, uh, write a description for it. Uh, you make a prefab out of your object and then you just select the type and hit submit. And then you will see it pop up on our, uh, portal page. So I'll pull up unity real quick and we can go over that in a little more detail. So here is a, uh, reference model of the bubble in the memviz that Timothy just showed you. Um, I have it in here just to sanity check the scale and everything of your object. Uh, our bubble is 10 unity units wide. Uh, so you can translate that into whatever modeling package you're using. Uh, so for the test, um, we have this little space shuttle model. If I wanted to uh, bring this into the game, this this is the model straight out of, uh, I, I feel, I think this one was made in Blender, but you know, any, whatever program you want to use. Uh, so you bring it in to the scene um, and bring in your icon, which I have down here that I had that was rendered separately. You can really make those however you want. A lot of the ones in the game have a transparent background, so you can use some sort of renderer like Marmoset or Maya or Blender, whatever to um, get an image. Um, so then uh, we will grab our material. Um, so this is the material with the customizable colors. Um, you can change the smoothness and you can add an emission if you would like. Um, so we'll uh, drag that over onto the model. And now it looks like all the default colors that are set to it. Um, also on the model itself, when you import it, it's everything's going to be dynamic. So you don't need to turn on the static button. You don't have to uh, change really very many of the settings. Um, so then we will add our mesh collider. Um, so that it doesn't clip through things and become lost <laughs> in a mess of 3D objects. <laughs> um, and then we will add our color controller. And so this is where you are able to add color sets. So here we, um, we have added uh, one color set. We have to set the size to one so that the tool um, understands that there is one there. And then we just put the material in there. And now we have our color selection. Um, so you can choose whatever colors you would like uh, for the demo purposes here. I guess I'll just stick with this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you can change it. You can click the randomize button. Oh, yeah. We can In click the randomize button. Sure. Yeah, make sure that your <laughs> renderer is set too. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, I just okay. normally drag the, I normally just drag the uh, renderer from the model in. Gotcha. Um, oh, where'd it go? We'll get there. There we go. Okay. Yeah, so if you hit play, it should apply that color set at runtime. Yeah, so if you move around, uh, rotate the guy around. Yeah. Well, it's the light. <laughs> Let me just turn the light real quick. Um, there we go. All right. There we go. So there's our random space colors. <laughs> um, very dark. Very dark. Very, very moody. <laughs> so I guess we can keep changing it. So you can just see it update uh, right there. There you go. I'm colorblind, but that looks like something I'd fly in. Yeah, yeah, we'll go with this. All right. <laughs> so in editor mode, it still doesn't display. Um, but it would show up that way in game on the same as the preview mode, right? So um, at that point, uh, we have added the necessary components to the uh, model. Um, I'll just 
name it space shuttle. And then we drag it down into the project uh, directory, make it an original prefab. And now we have our prefab that can go uh, get packed up and go right into the game. So we'll go, you go up here to Gallium Tools and open the tool. Um, on our website, you will, after you have uh, logged in, there's a section for you to get your keys that allow you to use the tool to authenticate um, and then submit an object through. So you just copy and paste those values from your own account in here. And then you just fill out the information here. So um, this is a space shuttle and we'll say it's going to the moon as a description. <laughs> and then we'll drag in the icon and the prefab. And then from here, you can choose tags that will be used in any search functionality so people can find it or you can find it in your own wallet once you have hundreds of objects, um, just like Timothy did with the walrus. So uh, I'll type in uh, space and shuttle and travel as examples. And make sure that the inventory type is set to decorator, which is for now the terminology that we're using to describe props that go in. Um, backgrounds would be those 360 backgrounds that have the um, illustrations on them. And a dais is what we used to call the ground objects. So like that Arctic ice and water or that neighborhood object with the sidewalk and the street that we saw on a previous slide. Um, and then I won't make you guys watch this part, but <laughs> we hit this uh, validate and submit blueprint next. And then it'll run through constructing all the asset bundles and everything that it needs to package the space shuttle up and send it off to the game. Um, so from there, we can go to the uh, actual portal here. Once you're logged in to the website, uh, over here on the left side, side we have our uh, dashboard you can click blueprints and it'll show you the blueprints that you have submitted right now mine has an approved icon because it was approved by an admin but if you had just submitted it you may need to wait for an admin to go in make sure it's not copyrighted or something we wouldn't want in the game and then um, once it's approved you can view the details and you can then mint the blueprint which is how you get a quantity of your choosing into the game. And once you do that, then you go to the asset minting column and you should see it here on top of all of my testing <laughs> for smoke effects um, right here. So I had 10 that were submitted into the game and how much they cost in the in-game currency. And uh, that's that. If you click on your assets, they show up in there too, right? Since oh. they've already been minted. Uh, right here in my wallet, yeah. I should. So this is your actual inventory. So if you go probably to the very end. Probably to the end, yep. There so you go. See it right here, there you 10 go. 10 space shuttles right there. All right. So it has the quantity, and I suppose if you want to delete it, <laughs> I don't know why you would. Um, yeah. And so then I have a bunch of other objects in here that we've been testing, and uh, that's about it for how that works. Um, So let's see, next page was just covering this. So, um. All right, so let, let's back up for a second here. So uh, John Somerville has asked, I came in a little late, oh. I'm not sure if this is addressed. How does this tool know where to apply each individual color? So that's a great, that's a great uh, question. We actually have another video up already about um, how the UV mapping works, but uh, Alex, would you mind giving like just a broad overview of like how you would map um, a 3D object to that texture to get your colors right. Sure. Um, yeah, I can do that. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm not a 3D artist. So what I will say <laughs> is all buzzwords and just you shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> so um, the idea is to, uh, it's not your traditional methods of UV mapping a 3D model. So with this, you're going to, uh, you're going to planar project um, the model onto the texture, like just from the side. Um, 
I guess to explain what that means, I can just drag Maya over here real quick. Um, so here I have the space shuttle inside of Maya. Um, uh, where's my UV? There's my UV. So this is what the UV map looks like for this shader. Um, if you remember, though, I don't have the texture in here right now. I can dig it up if that would be an easier visual. But um, uh, the basic idea is that those color strips are in here. And you, you can see that they are different. Um, if I pull up that image real quick. Oh. Maybe. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that one. There we go. All right. There okay. you go. This thing. <laughs> um, so this image here. Uh, yeah, it's not letting me. I just, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just open it and explore over here and pull it over. This thing. There we go. That's easier to see. Um, so. You just uh, basically you can bring that into your modeling program if you'd like. Um, if I go into, I guess I'll just do this real quick. Um, if I go in here to my material and I choose a file for it to pull up, um, and then I pull in the actual object. Okay, so now. We can see, of course, it has a transparency thing turned on. Uh, I'll just set it to something else. Oh, wait, I might have to delete that in here. All right. Wasn't prepared for this. One second. <laughs> there we go. OK. Um, so we have the uh, color shader on here. and. Now we can see it in our UV map. So the idea is that you can, if we completely delete the UVs on this, um, and we start, we start fresh here. Um, I can grab this thing, and let's say I want to just project it from one side. Uh, so this is, I'll, I'll do it on the z-axis here, um, and it pops up uh, just like that roughly the same shape and you just want to kind of scale it down and then drag it into a section where there is color for it. So now it's blue because it's in the blue section. And then that blue slot in unity is where you are able to change that color to whatever you want. And if I wanted a little gradient, I could drag it down here and then we'll have a little gradient effect on it. And in unity, you can customize it more. Um, does that make sense in general? So I too, if I was too fast, I can answer any questions. Um, John says, cool. Um, okay. We do actually have uh, tutorial videos on this as well, John. Yeah. Uh, they go, that go way, you know, a little bit more into detail. And uh, thanks, Alex, for <laughs> tap dancing and showing it off real quick. <laughs> sure. But yeah, the, no problem. But yeah, the, the idea, uh, if you, Alex, if you go back to the tool uh, or to the UGC tool. Um, what do you want me to just Pull up. Yeah, I was going to look at the at where you assign the color sets. There you go. So uh, right here where it says add skin, right? Skin zero. So the, the idea is that you are creating you know, a space shuttle and you want to supply, you know, I don't know, 10, 12 different uh, color, color, color variations for your players, whoever, whoever gets your space shuttle to play with. Um, as you add these skins here, uh, the randomized buttons obviously just picking stuff to show you where it's at. But if you click add skin at the bottom, you know, uh, I just realized we have a bad idea here. Um, it's not limited at the moment. Uh, so you have an unlimited <laughs> supply of color sets. We need to put a cap on that. Um, <laughs> but so you could have, um, this has been good for, um, you know, if you make a bear, it's like, okay, well, here's your grizzly bear, here's your polar bear, here's your panda bear, here's your, you know, different um, colorings to, one person can buy one app, you know, one of your objects and then use it in four or five different ways. That's the idea behind it. Um, in the game itself, um, the primitives are using that currently. Um, I could show that real quick. Let me make sure it works. He said, adding a light to the scene. 
<laughs> yeah, let me let me share my screen real quick, and I'll I'll do that. Sure. Um, I'm still doing this right. Okay, you guys see that? Yes. Okay, so uh, baked into the to the memory visualization, we have um, some things called primitives. Um, primitives are things that you don't need to uh, acquire. They're just like, you know, there's an unlimited supply of them. So I put a cone in here. Um, let me add another primitive. I'm going to add a cube. All right. I'll put it down here to where you can see the color. So when I click on uh, this interface will change. This is still kind of alpha, but everyone see that like color palette thing hanging out above it? Yeah. Oops. All right. So if I click on the color palette, this will cycle through those color sets. Now the, the primitives are boring. They're all one single color, um, which uh, in Alex's example, basically the entire primitive was dragged to one channel of that color, uh, which makes perfect sense for a primitive. And I, it, it might make perfect sense for the type of thing you want to make as well. Um, but as I play with it, I'm like, okay, well now I've got a, you know, I think this is white, um, a white cube. And I can make this it be a, a different colored cone. But yeah, that, that's the idea of, um, of how you would, uh, uh, let me delete that line. That's the idea of how you would, um, allow your players to change it on the fly when they're making their memories. Uh, OK, so what do we have left? I'll stop sharing again. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we're there at the end where we had the uh, pictures of the bubbles. So these are just some examples of what memory bubbles can look like. Yeah, these are, um, you know, all different, uh, you know, combination of, of different assets made by uh, different people. Or uh, if you have a favorite artist, you know, you can follow them and see all the stuff that they're producing. And you can, you know, get their content as well. Um, and make these fun little visualizations. Um, and this is all step, this is all phase two of a six phase game. Uh, Proxy is about memories, is about building your AI. Um, and I don't have anything to show at the moment, but we have an entire world, different planets as well, that all these things decorate. Um, but that's for, uh, siege in November by the time we'll be there. <laughs> all right. So, uh, yeah, uh, at this point, I guess we can open it up to questions, comments, concerns, things people like to see more. One of the questions we got in Twitch is on how these will actually be, how the UGC will actually be incorporated into the game itself when the time comes. Yeah, good question. So the, um, when we, let me share the screen again. Sure. All right, so here is our portal. Um, so I'm assuming they're asking like, how does the UGC like get into the game itself? Um, so the uh, the the core the core root of where everything starts is a blueprint. So you make your blueprint, which is what Alex just demoed, and then uh, the blueprint is just data. It doesn't actually exist as a tangible item until we uh, what we call minting it. Uh, as you mint these things, uh, the blueprints. Uh, go, you know, you, the blueprint is like your, your, your mold or your, uh, you know, that data is uh, immutable and never changes. And you can forge as many of these as you want. Uh, so as you forge them, uh, by default, they go into your inventory uh, because you're making them for yourself. The thing that we're uh, going to be unleashing in just a couple of weeks is the marketplace where people can uh, take things that they have uh, either they've they've minted their own and they want to sell them on the marketplace to the other players for in-game currency, uh, or things that you've you've acquired. Uh, there's a buy, sell, and trade uh, of these assets, and um, that's not the only way to get them. You also get them 
as you complete objectives in the game as well. These are kind of given out as rewards, not the ones that people, the content creators make, although we do have some spotlight programs we can talk about a little bit later of if someone makes something that's just like really cool and we you know, ask them permission to like start making them for people. Um, but Gallium, we're making, you know, thousands of these objects. So as you complete objectives in the game, as you, as proxies uh, uh, growing and understanding things, um, then you will uh, receive them as rewards. And so, okay, so now you've got all this stuff. Like, let me, let me click on my, uh, my wallet here. Um, I'm going to move my, I don't know if you guys can see me fighting hidden Dementors. Um, so I've got lots of stuff. Uh, so like this one here, right? Um, this is this is clothing that's asleep. That's kind of fun. Um, and I have five of them. So if I wanted to on the marketplace, I could sell three of these, I could sell all five of them. Um, and by selling them, it's basically uh, a traditional auction house style thing where I'm making a listing. I'm saying, here's how much in-game currency I want for it. Um, who wants to buy it? And so you as a UGC creator, if you're making this content, um, you can potentially, uh, you know, make yourself uh, a whole printing press of this stuff of I'm making content, I'm earning currency through that, and then I'm spending that currency on whatever I want in the game. Um, so that's like part of our economy and ecosystem. Hopefully that answers that question. And I'm guessing that that 4,220 euros in the upper right-hand corner has something to do with that as well. That's right. So um, uh, TBD, we're not sure if euros is what we're going to stick with. Uh, we're not sure if we're getting too, a little too close to an actual currency's name uh, for the comfort of some. Um, but yeah, so like, uh, let me go into my blueprint. So I only have two. I'm not much of an artist. I stole these uh, FBXs from our art team. Sorry, Alex. So um, clothing pack. So uh, in this one, I have a tiara, I have a sailor suit, and I have a swimsuit. And this is just clothing that you could put onto one of the avatars um, or a tank top. So this is just a uh, this is just a blueprint. This doesn't show up in the game at all until I go to mint it. Um, minting takes in-game currency to mint it. Um, how much in-game currency is still to be determined because we're playing around with different types of blueprints uh, where we're introducing rarity uh, in the next batch. So where you could, as a creator, you could say, oh, this is common. The mold will never break. I could mint millions of them. Um, and you know, while they're all unique and special, you know, it's, it's kind of a common item. The idea of, of uh, uh, rares and ultra rares, which once again, we're still working on, is the idea that your mold will break after a certain number of mintings. So if you're, um, you know, if you've got a little bit of a Twitch following or if you've got a little bit of a social media following or you're, you're a, you know, a, an, indie, an indie game uh, dev who has some cool assets they would just love to have be in the game, you could make something like ultra rare to where you can only mint it 10 times and then the blueprint breaks forever, um, which makes those 10 that you created in the, in the ecosystem that, mu that much more special uh, for whoever ends up with it. Um, so yeah, the the kind of the game loop for a creator is you need to earn enough currency to make uh, enough mint enough things with that currency to then earn more currency, and that's kind of the loop there. And watch out! I see Brad wanting to go for non fungible token items already. <laughs> so and I vote by the way that you call the money either galliums or Brad. I think ten uh, Brads to mint an item would be an appropriate. Uh, trading uh, amount. That's right. I, you know, buying and selling of brads. I think we can all stand by that. Can you put the Discord link back up if you're willing to share that out on YouTube again? I think we have some folks out there pretty interested in that. <laughs> we and can. Br Brad Merritt says the value is very low. <laughs> uh, looks like Simon has asked, how are you addressing the reintroduction of the blueprint that would devalue the mints? That's a good one. So, um, there's nothing stopping, uh, well, all right. There, there's one gate that is currently stopping all blueprints from being able to be minted. There's an approval process you have to go through. Um, so our approval right now is 20% AI and 80% human. Uh, we're hoping to get that way on the other side so we can flip it. 
Um, so the uh, once we get into the the rares and the ultra rares, um, each blueprint is unique and it is immutable. So uh, if you were a creator and you decided to 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 reintroduce a blueprint, uh, it would have a new ID. And so if you forged it, it would say one out of a hundred. Let's say let's say the max was a hundred before it broke. Um, the content community uh, can look up these the originals and see if you've made like a designer fake or if you've um, kind of just pulled a bait and switch with the community. And we're hoping that just like some social pressure and some people calling it out will be enough. Um, that said, uh, it's all fluid. We're, we're not exactly sure. Um, we're, we're kind of, we have some good ideas and I think it's gonna evolve as we actually unleash this out and people start playing with it. Um, but so far the community that we've kind of grown has been the, it's, it's sub 200, but the community has been all really supportive of each other. And um, the only shenanigans have been like just funny stuff, like in jest, not in, you know, <laughs> actual malice. Would you mind sharing the, the, what's on the developer tools right now in the tech hub? Is that what is available for everybody who wants to be involved? This is, yeah, we're, we're slowly gating this in. Um, uh, so uh, if you, uh, the current is through the Discord, uh, that Discord link. If you go through that, um, we have our, uh, uh, what, am I, what am I trying to say? The, it's not a sign-up page, but it's, a, it's, it's where you ask to, you know, uh, you, you agree to the terms of service to get in. And we're letting people in over the next um, over the next few weeks, we're letting 10 at a time, 15 at a time as we're kind of growing that capacity out. Uh, so the Discord is where I would point most people first. Um, if you don't want to go through Discord, we do have the email sign up as well, um, which Alex, if you wouldn't mind posting that into the chat, if you haven't already. Because it, sure. it was in our slideshow, but sure. uh, both, of, both of those links we can get in. Um, if you want to I'll just post the Discord slide, link again, if you want to put that slide back up for people, that'd be great. We do yeah, have, let's do uh, that too. Number of folks cool. watching the stream and not just here. Right. So let's do that. If right. you don't mind. The um, yeah, the the lawyers keep changing our language on the terms of service, which is why we're a little slow on it. Sorry about that. Um, but the 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 short the short human readable version of the terms of service is uh, you're not going to upload anything horrific, and you're not going to do anything that Disney is going to sue us over. So no Darth Vader's, no Mickey Mouse. Perfect, perfect. Out of curiosity, uh, in your forums, what are you seeing as some of the most requested items to be built that haven't been built yet? Yeah, uh, it's funny. Uh, Alex has actually been cracking away on that as well. Um, so the, the one that was the most requested, because I may have fudged some numbers in the background, um, was uh, arcade cabinets. So that one came up first. <laughs> Um, but Alex, what, what else has been on the uh, list of uh, people asking for things to be built? Um, I guess, yeah, we have the arcade cabinet, which is work in progress. Uh, there was an ice cream truck. Um, <laughs> what else do we have? Uh, I'm blanking on the entire list, but maybe some subtle references to some other games from the past. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's one of the things that we're uh, we're really excited about is that a lot of the people who have um, who have joined the community already, and many of the people who are waiting to get in are um, kind of the usual suspects: Sims fans, SimCity fans, things, things like that. And while most of them are hobbyists and tinkerers on their own that make stuff, um, we've uh, we had someone request that we make the reticulating spline. Um, <laughs> we had another person. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that was a loading message from the Sims. Uh, that nonsensical loading message. Um, there is uh, another one, which is the, uh, this was from a, a Maxis alumnus, uh, asked us to make the llama. Um, uh, I guess it, it was more of a Maxis inside joke, but Will was never like lead designer or CEO of Maxis or any of that. Um, he was officially the, oh my goodness, I'm gonna ruin it. Llama herding enthusiast. <laughs> That was his official title. Looks like we got a couple more questions in there. 
Yep. Um, uh, John Somerville's asking about the purpose of the minted items and how they'll be used in the game. So maybe we could explain the AI part a little bit, I guess, to help understand their importance. Sure, sure. So the um, at the end of the day, proxy is a game about memories. Uh, you are programming an AI or multiple AIs by adding memories to them. So when you are uh, creating these memories, the first layer of it is uh, concept creation and concept, um, well, concept, co concept entry, concept creation, where you're adding um, brief or long form narrative, you're adding, and it's doing this best to parse things it understands into the categories. Um, after that, it goes into visualization. Uh, well, it's technically render, because uh, render is, for us, it means both audio and visual. Um, so the render is, uh, could be a just 2D picture that you uploaded off of your, your computer or your phone, or you search the web for. It could be some sort of three, 360 panorama uh, photo, um, background image, uh, or it could be this entire detailed scene. It can also be um, audio recording. So if you just want to narrate a memory of, and just actually have it be your, your voice um, uh, doing that, that's also part of it. Where I'm going here is that as you add these pieces to the memory, um, that augments the understanding of the AI engine. Uh, we call it the cortex. Each one, when Alex was showing earlier the blueprints, they have um, tags. And the tags are um, mostly tokenized for people to um, have things be searchable either in the marketplace or searchable in their own inventories and things like that. But it's also being tokenized uh, and parsed by our word to vec engines that are used by the underlying AI. So as you add things, um, uh, so travel. So I added a spaceship uh, and I didn't even realize travel was added to that underlying data of the memory. So as proxy starts to ask you questions, um, and we actually just had like a really big breakthrough on our, our Cortex NLP stuff. So as proxy starts to ask you questions or converse about stuff or write poems, um, travel is going to start to come up in that memory where you put the rocket ship. Um, so that is a long way to say that as you add these aesthetics, it's also uh, helping seed the AI engine underneath. Uh, okay, Simon asks, how would sound effects music work in relationship to blueprints and minting? That's, they're, they're identical. Um, so in, uh, when Alex was showing that he drug in the, um, the spacecraft, he added textures and things like to, that to it, exact same thing. We have a primitive, um, or we have a, we have a, an audio prefab that you drag in. It's kind of like preset with all the, there's two or three different options on it. Uh, most of it's like Unity engine stuff that you would all expect, like, you know, 3D audio or if it loops and things like that. Um, when you uh, add your um, MP3 or your, your OBV or your sound file to it, um, you create a, a unique prefab from that. And that's what gets bundled up into the asset bundle system and then published up to, the, uh, to our backend. So as people, um, you know, purchase or you trade or you just gift people, you know, uh, two or three of your, so let's say it's a song, let's say it's a 45 second song that you, that you wrote, uh, just a guitar riff or something. Um, when you add that to your memory, that prefab is what gets downloaded and then it gets processed by the scene and then starts to play with its different, you know, distance and things like that. So uh, for music, it's exactly the same. And uh, at the moment we have one category called audio. I'm pretty sure that's going to get split pretty quick to be sound effects versus stings. Um, and we're, we're trying to ask people, there, there are file size limitations. So you can't just like, you know, upload, you know, Space Oddity or some huge, you know, flack version of, you know, the uh, Weezer album or something. Um, dating myself, apparently. So um, that's kind of the limitations is, is, is mostly about size and space, uh, but treated exactly the same way. Okay, so proxy itself, what is the assignment asks, uh, what is the end of the goal as a game? At the moment, I'm understanding the players are to compose memories with the end goal of generating the digital proxy of yourself, but for what? To create a more accurate avatar of myself to better interact in the digital sense? Kind of. 
Um, Will isn't really a big fan of games having endings. Um, every game Will has made has an ending-ish, I guess. Um, but he's more a fan of like these sandboxes that go on forever. Um, you know, SimCity, <clears throat> you you end up being a uh, ecu ecumenical. Uh, what's the one where it's the entire planet like Curson, like a uh, ecumenopolis? Um, in any case, they're, they're kind of like these high level goals. Um, but the, the game is to create this simulation, this AI that um, unlocks its abilities, the more uh, information you feed it, uh, the, more, the more you play with it. And then there's these entire worlds that you create as well. And the worlds, that's a really cool, that's, that's like the really big next phase of the game is incorporating the world and <clears throat> having players be able to, to, to create these worlds together and the proxies are involved and they're learning and they're helping and they're asking questions and they're playing with you. So that's about the best answer I can give you for like an end goal. End goal is to get your proxy to be, um, has uh, leveled up and as, as, under, uh, as deep as you want it to be. We've joked around about the movie Her where at the end of that movie, they all just leave and they go to another dimension or whatever. My theory is that they don't go to another dimension at all. They just put everybody, humanity on mute. But that's, you know, because I don't believe in other dimensions um, that, that AIs could reach anyway. But anyway, hope that, hope that answers your question. So amusingly, most of the comments in the YouTube chat are about Llama. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought you should know that. I think Llama will be in high demand even more so than... Uh, Mikey Moose, which was a suggestion after they heard they can't bring in <laughs> Mickey Mouse. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, so um, that, that was the thing, is that the llama kind of became its own it, its own thing, and it showed up in so many of the games, and um, it, it's going to be in proxy, don't worry. All right, well, we are at 8 o'clock. I will uh, give YouTube and the chat here one more minute to come up with uh, questions before we let our guests go, and I'll make some final announcements about SimFest while you compose your questions and we deal with the delay in chat so we can get what they are. All right, so we do have SimFest. Uh, this is the kickoff for it. We will be taking it up again starting at 1130 Eastern uh, with the Quest for Social Connection by Kimmy Ko and Atlanta Gamer Life. Noon is an interesting look at uh, workflows for video game programming called Irrigating the River of Content, How to Make Workflows at Work. 1 p.m. is an incredible roundtable designing non-toxic communities with uh, Sandy Chen, who's the IGDA's uh, lead for the game design SIG. This fellow Brad Merritt from some uh, unknown company called Cartoon Network. Gatti Shields Moon from Shell Games. Joshua Quinnett from Gallium Studios. Auburn Morrow from Hi Res. Jared Creasy from... Uh, Tripwire, Isaiah Turner from High Res, Judy Tyre from Jane Austen, the game, and Tony Jones from High Res. A lot of great info coming out of that one. I'm really looking forward to that session. 2 p.m., your text editor and you by Clark Chambers from the U.S. Army Game Studio. If you are an experienced coder or looking to get into it, that one's going to be of value. 3 o'clock is our keynote panel, Flavored by Authenticity, How Personal Experiences Amplify Narrative. Again, with Sandy Shen joining us. Kimberly Unger, who's been doing a lot of work um, with Oculus, uh, Dr. Matthew Farber from the Gaming SEL Lab, and Juni Juliana Lowe. That's uh, a great uh, look at narrative design. So looking, hope you can join us for that keynote session. 4 p.m. will be Relational Joints Gameplay. Simon Hoff is showing a whole new look at um, gameplay. Hey, Simon, why don't you go ahead and unmute, and we'll give you a minute to talk about that one if you like. Sure. Uh, so relational joints gameplay, it's a concept of a design framework that I have been working on for a year plus at this time. And it's basically a framework that help is helping us to give us language and uh, conceptual tools to form a way to better structure and talk about a design experience as a whole. Uh, usually we have like this monolithic idea of what a design is, and we have pretty good ideas of specifics of the design and how they relate to each other, some things that are more important at the start or at the end, but there isn't really like a, a good cohesive way of structuring that design experience from end, uh, from start to end. And that's really what I'm trying to attempt with this, with this new framework. 
And if you've tuned in any of Simon's other presentations, lots of good information there. Uh, five o'clock, the Clutter Mini Talks, Tales from the Indie Dev Front Lines by some guy named Joe. Yes, Joe Castle with puzzles by Joe, talking about all the lessons he's learned as an indie dev. And we'll conclude at 6 p.m. Stu Phelps and Jason House from uh, Blue Bomber Games just released Looking for Heels, just took it out of early access. Spent over a year in early access and said they learned a lot of lessons there. And they're looking forward to sharing that. So that'll be winning early access at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern. All right. With that, I am not seeing new questions in either chat. So thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Special thanks to Alex Dudley and Timothy Johnson from Gallium Studios for this great information. You can get this video and our others on uh, what they're doing with Proxy AI and their tools on our YouTube channel, which most of you are already watching anyway. So uh, join us tomorrow at 11.30 and uh, get to work on these Gallium tools. Lots of fun stuff you can make. Thank you for joining us. Take care, all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andrew.